I'd love to welcome you to this interview between Dr. Nicole Avina and Dr. Pampa. Dr. Nicole Avina is a research neuroscientist and an expert in the fields of nutrition, diet, and addiction. Dr. Avina is presently assistant professor of neuroscience at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City and a visiting professor in health psychology at Princeton University. She has published over 90 scholarly journal articles on topics related to diet, nutrition, and overeating, and she frequently presents her research findings at scientific conferences and university symposia. Dr. Ravina has written the books, Why Diets Fail, What to Eat When You're Pregnant, and What to Feed Your Baby and Toddler. Dr. Ravina is a sought-after speaker, and she regularly appears on the Dr. Oz Show. She has also been a guest on several radio programs and podcasts and has been filmed for several documentaries on the obesity epidemic. She has a TED Talk entitled How Sugar Affects Your Brain, as well as a blog on psychology today called Food Junkie. I hope you enjoy. Well, welcome, Nicole. Uh, We are so excited because you're going to be speaking at our big event and and uh, this is a great event because it's the first time that actually the public, we're having the public, but we have doctors from all over the world there, literally, and uh, the experts uh, from around the world, scientists from the Netherlands, from across America on ketosis, fasting, uh, diet, you name it. But I'm telling you, your talk may be the most useful of all, even for the doctors that are there, because all of that's fine, fasting, ketosis and all these things that everyone's going to be learning about, cancer. But if you're addicted and you can't break your habits to any food, then right. you know, we're all dead in the water. We might as well just all shut our mouths and go home, right? So your talk could be the talk of the seminar. <laughs> so go ahead. Well, that would be great. Um, and I think you know it, it really does touch on a big point that The addiction component to food and sugar addiction in particular, which is what I'll be talking a lot about, it's just such a big part of all of this, of of wellness and of eating healthy. And it's really the barrier that many people face before they can embark on whatever health journey they want to go on. So I'm going to be talking a lot about the psychology of it and why sugar is addictive, what you can do to avoid it from happening in the first place and what you can do to mitigate it once it has happened and really just get into the science behind it because there's so much research that's gone on to this topic now um, that it's just such an interesting part of it. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, you know, we have uh, Dominic D'Agostino talking about ketosis and et cetera, but I have watched more people fail because of the psychology around eating, sugar addiction, et cetera, ketosis, fasting. I mean, all of the things we're discussing. In matter of fact, I would say cancer is a big topic and of this seminar. And again, yeah, these are extremely addicted to sugar because this, uh, the cancer cells desire it. But again, you're not going to win this battle oftentimes in the physiology. It is psychology. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, I think that's why I'm, I'm so happy to be speaking at this event along with these other wonderful speakers and these topics that are so related. And I think that you know, the psychology of eating is something that we don't always think about, right? Because we just think, oh, okay, we need to change our habits. We need to eat healthier. And we get this plan and we get, you know, this information and we say, okay, let's go ahead and do it. But we can't because it's so difficult. And there is just so much that goes into habit formation. And our brains are actually rewired And it is difficult to change that wiring once we've been eating in a way for a very long time. And so that's really where the psychology of this comes in and understanding the intersects between psychology and neuroscience, which is my area. And really, you know, how can you change that wiring in your brain? How can you change those habits? How can you think differently about the foods that you're eating? How can you break those craving cycles? And how can you really get on a track that you want to be on where you're eating the types of foods you want to eat and you're able to put sugar and carbohydrates aside? And it's not always easy for everybody, but that's why I hope people come and hear my talk because I'm going to walk people through the research and how you can do it. Yeah. How did you get into this? Oh boy, I got into this a long time ago. Um, I was actually a grad student at Princeton University. I was doing my PhD there. And the professor that I had started doing research with 
we just started talking about things that I could study for my PhD. And I was really interested in the brain and food and, you know, why people choose to eat certain foods over the others. And we started thinking about, well, maybe people choose to eat certain foods because they're addicted to them. Like maybe they can't control their choices in the ways that, you know, drug addicts can't always control their choices. And so that kind of led into this whole, you know, what's turned into a career for me of understanding how sugar affects the brain. And what we've uncovered is that it affects it in a way that's very much like an addictive substance. So the same effects that you would see with drugs like nicotine or alcohol or even morphine, we see happening when people use sugar and overeat sugar, the same types of changes in the brain, the same types of behaviors emerge. Yeah, I mean, you know, so it becomes a point where it's almost not their fault. I mean, it, you know, this is creating, the psychology creates a physiology that is, you're not gonna win, you know? I mean, it, right. it, I mean if 3% of people can get off drugs, you know, for good, that shows you the yeah. odds that you're up against. But there's ways, obviously, to increase those odds. I mean, you're going to share some of that at the seminar, but kind of open that door a little bit. Yeah, and you know, again, it's, it's certainly so difficult for people who are combating addictions to drugs and alcohol, but you also have to keep in mind that our society has created it such that, you know, we have advertisement bans on alcohol and on nicotine and drugs, and, you know, they're not readily available for most people, whereas sugar and foods are everywhere. I mean, no matter where you go, you're seeing advertisements for them. And so this is really just an added layer of the battle, right, is to try to figure out how you can navigate through these addictive substances of sugars and carbohydrates in a world that is loaded with them. And, you know, for many people who are suffering from drug and alcohol addiction, they can choose to, you know, avoid people who are using drugs or avoid places where there's alcohol. But for people who are suffering with an addiction to sugar, that's not a possibility. There's sugars everywhere. And so that's some of the things that I'm going to touch on is how do you navigate in a world that's so sugar centric and what can you actually do? How can you recognize where the sugars are? And even just from like a simple social psychology standpoint of, you know, how do you say no? How do you tell somebody, hey, I don't want some of your birthday cake or you know what? Hey, I don't really want to have, you know, that slice of cake because it happens to be, you know, an office party and I feel obligated. There's so much social psychology around eating that that really plays into the discussion too. And I plan to talk a lot about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, those are the battles right there. I mean, if you don't have a plan uh, for those situations, I mean, like you said, I mean, for an alcoholic, uh, the plan's pretty easy. Uh, you know, don't go into bars and, and stay away from those uh, situations. It's impossible with sugar. I mean, you can't walk into a grocery store without being confronted with your addiction. It is, it is. And so that's some of the things that I want to talk talk through at the seminar, you know, really just how to recognize where sugars are, how to avoid them, and then when you do encounter them, how to cope. Because I think that's really the number one thing that trips people up, is that we get in these sort of awkward social situations or these sort of impulsive moments where we end up wanting to give in. And that's what leads us down this path of derailment. And so I want to talk through, you know, how you can avoid that. And if it does happen, what you can do to rectify the situation. Yeah, you know, I mean, <clears throat> this topic really plays into, um, you speak at the seminar on Friday, and um, Saturday is more, more of a cancer focus, but uh, what the doctors coming have to realize is this, um, you, you have to get these cancer people away from sugar. Sugar feeds the cancer cells. They're going to hear that by, you know, many scientists, you know, but the scientists talk about, you know, okay, sugar feeds cancer cells, sugar feeds cancer cells, as you have to do. But no, no one's talking about the 800 pound gorilla in the room. It's like, okay, that's all, all fine and good. But you know, these people have a greater desire for sugar even than the average person. You know, so what do you do about it? I mean, you're going to be giving them some plans on here's what you need to do. Otherwise, your cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and you know, I think that's really the critical step is telling people, everybody knows that they need to give up sugar sugar, but not too many people know how to do it. No. And so, and especially if you're in a situation where you're, you know, facing a cancer diagnosis and, or some other type of diagnosis where you, know, you have that added stressor involved. I mean, we have to remember one of the main reasons why people use sugar is because it's a way to self-medicate and make us feel good. 
And so when you're taking that away in a stressful situation, that just adds a whole other dimension of issues that you know, need to be addressed from a psychological standpoint. So I'm going to talk about you know, some of the other coping mechanisms that pe people can use or some other coping mechanisms that can be recommended that people use to get people away from using food as a drug. Because that's essentially what happens is that people have become addicted to sugar because they're using it like it's a drug. They're using it to feel good when they're depressed. They're using it to make them feel better about themselves. Or they're just using it because it feels good and it's everywhere. And it's become this habit that's developed over many, many years. And so I'll talk about different ways in which we can turn all those things around so that people yeah. aren't so dependent on it. Well, I mean, you, you're, you're coming to the seminar because you become an expert in this. Uh, you know, one of the the leaders that I recognize, you know, and I, I said to you before we started uh, the interview, you know, gosh, I mean, I can tell you as a practitioner, I, it, it's too big of an elephant for me. I, I don't want to tackle it. I, I would sooner say, you know, you need to go to this gal's website. You know, she is, you know, you got, you have to dial in here. That's why the practitioners, y'all have to learn this stuff. I mean, honestly, I mean, obviously you're giving the practitioner, the doctor strategies, you know, um, how to deal with it. But, you know, ultimately, you have to be able to recognize that there is a way so you can help these people because otherwise you're going to fail for your patient in front of you. Right. And I think that's the big thing is for, you know, everyone who is working to help people is to just educate each other and to provide people with the resources because no one's going to do it all on their right. own for their patients. And that's really, I think... Our goal is to, you know, educate other practitioners about where they can go to get yeah. the help that they need for their patients and where they can direct them to get the resources and the assistance that they need. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, in this seminar in particular, it was like I, we, I did something very different. I, well, number one, the first time the public is actually going to be there. But, um, you know, I, I, instead of just giving people problems, meaning, okay, we're going to be talking about like, you know, here's that. I brought people in like yourself to bring in some really good resources uh, for the practitioner and the public alike to be successful, right? Because again, I, I think that people um, fail in this area more than, more than any. And it, it kind of like, it's not dealt with. The people are just kind of shoved aside, um, just like, oh, oh, they're not disciplined enough. It's, it's really, you talk about that. I mean, it's really not like that. It's a much deeper issue. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that I, I hope that the research that we've been doing in my lab and other people who've been doing similar research has, you know, started to make people to see is that it's a biological problem. There are, is a brain basis to this, just like with other addictions. And so we have to take the sort of self-blame off of the patient and, you know, start to look at this through the lens of a true addiction and try to then treat it as a true addiction and offer resources to people through that um, you know, purview, because I think for too, too many years, it has been, you know, the idea that, oh, it's the patient's fault. They don't have willpower. They're just not, yeah. they're not strong enough to do this or they don't want to do it. And that's not the case. And I think that now that we're starting to really understand this, you know, through addictions and understand how the addiction process is working with food, then more and more people are, are taking that seriously. And I think it's really helping patients. And the people that I've worked with and who I've talked to over the years, you know, it's, it's really changed the way that they approach their diet and nutrition. When they hear that, you know, it's not my fault that I, you know, can't stop eating these things. They, it really allows them a different way to look at the whole right. picture. And I think that that's really helpful for many, many people. Are there different levels of, of addiction like there are with so many, right? I mean, you know, okay, you know, I'm addicted to sugar. This person is like, no, you have no idea how I'm addicted. Is there, are there those levels like that? I think there are. And then this is just me speaking, you know, from a research standpoint, we're not there in terms of classifying like different mm -hmm. levels of addiction. And, you know, I think that though, from just, you know, my just reflection and working with people over the years, I think that all of us, even you and I are at risk for becoming addicted to sugar because of our environment, right? Just like if, you know, we lived in an environment that was loaded with drugs and alcohol nonstop, we would probably be at greater risk for becoming addicted to those things. And so I think everybody is at risk for sure. But when it comes to the actual addiction, I think that there are people who have varying degrees of it. And I've met people over the years who have, you know, an addiction to the point where, they have to do a full-blown abstinence. They can't have any sugar at all in their diet, not even you know, a drop of artificial sweetener. That's enough to set them off. 
Whereas other people are able to kind of adopt more of a harm reduction approach mm -hmm. where they can have slightly less sugar over time and that's allowing them to get control over how much they eat. But it really depends on the individual. And this is something I'm gonna get into more at the seminar yeah. in terms of, you know, how do you kind of decide who is who? Right. And how do you decide that was my if question. you're a full-blown you know, addict or right. if it's somebody who maybe just needs some help mitigating, you know, some of these binges once That in a was while. my question, yeah, you, you said that. Okay, I'm glad you're gonna get into that because that's what I was saying is like, can we, how do we identify these people? Because as a practitioner, I, you know, I wanna be able to identify them you know, it's like, is there any, like, association with people who have, like, other addictions, gambling, drugs? I mean, are they more, are, there, are they going to sugar next once they're off of the gambling? Now they're a sugar right. addict? Is there that crossover? Yeah, right. So there's been, and I'll talk more through the research at the seminar, but the two big links that have come out in the research have been the link between bariatric surgery and addictions oh. to sugar and also alcohol and addiction to sugar. And they seem to be two way streets, meaning that the research suggests that, you know, people who have a history of alcoholism in their family or alcoholism themselves are at greater risk for then having addictions to sugar. And a lot of it goes back to the fact that, you know, alcohol is a sugar, right? I mean, that gets metabolized into sugar in our, in our bloodstreams and, you know, it acts as a very powerful sugar, you know, in our brains. So it makes sense to me from that standpoint. Yeah. Gosh, I, I, I can't wait. I, I can't wait to hear more. And, and again, I, it's, this, this is, uh, you know, we're opening up a lot of cans of worms with the different diets and the fasting. <laughs> You're going to address the 800 pound gorilla in the room, <laughs> thousand pounds actually. Uh, but you know, the thing I love is, you know, you have answers and you have solutions and everyone needs to hear it. So I appreciate you, Dr. Nicole, taking time out of your busy research schedule and sharing your research and data with us. But you know what? You're sharing it with some of the top doctors in the world that need to hear your research. That's why I was like, you know, my doctors and the doctors, they need to hear what you're doing. They need to hear this. So thank you so much. Oh, yeah. I'm really looking forward to the event and speaking to, you know, all the doctors and practitioners and the public that will be attending. I think it's really going to be great and very educational for everybody. Yeah. And, and like always, folks, click here to sign up for the seminar. It's going to be a game changer. So thanks, Doc. Appreciate you.